Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience, and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their diverse stories, experiences, and get their insights. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review, as it will help others to learn about Autism Stories. On today's episode, Sam Stein joins us to discuss her YouTube channel, Yosemite Sam, and creating a retreat for neurodivergent entrepreneurs. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Sam, thanks so much for joining me here on Autism Stories. I'd love to start off by learning where does your story in the autistic community begin? Um, well, I would say it probably begins around six or seven years ago when I first started looking into the possibility that I might be autistic. It was after the birth of my first child, my son. And I don't know if you know, when you have little babies, you spend a lot of time sitting on the sofa, probably watching TV. <laughs> and so I watched a lot of YouTube during that time. And I eventually came across videos about autism that kept on getting shown to me. And I thought, OK, this sounds interesting. And then it, it basically gave me a very uh, clear picture of my own life in a way that was quite surprising to me at the time. That was the, the sort of trigger moment that started it off. And then I kind of discovered more and more about autism and, and where I fit in and eventually um, got my diagnosis in 20, 2018, I think. Now, I'd imagine uh, many of our listeners of Autism Stories have something in common with me and that we've been big fans of your YouTube channel for several years. Yosemite Sam. I, be I believe it's been about five years since you started the channel and so many things have changed in terms of content creation across the internet since then for sure. So, so I'm wondering how you look at content creation for us as autistic people compared to what it was five years ago. Well, when I started, there was definitely less people making that kind of content. I think not only has just the amount of people getting diagnosed rapidly increased, that's that's also resulted in a, an increase in content creation among autistic creators. But, but also, I think that social media has changed. The platforms have changed in a way that could be argued makes it more accessible for people to do it because people can do it on their phones. With YouTube... You can do YouTube on your phone for sure, but a lot of people would, would prefer to have like a filming setup, for example. And now with Instagram and TikTok, and they're prioritizing short form video, they're prioritizing something that's kind of like simple and a bit rough and ready, you know. And so it's far easier now for anyone to, to pick up camera and start making content, pick up their phone and start making content. And, and I think that has obviously major benefits because we are able to communicate our experiences well it also has drawbacks um such as spreading misinformation it really has changed a lot in five years i was not the first autistic content creator by far but there were there weren't so many around when i started and now there really are a lot of different people and we're getting more perspectives even though you know the diversity within the people who are prominent autistic creators is maybe not where we'd like it to be but we've certainly been headed in the right direction in the last five years in the last year you've shifted your focus working closely with neurodivergent business owners and entrepreneurs who need support with their business growth strategy are there some common missteps you think many neurodivergent business owners and entrepreneurs make when looking to grow their business? I think we have a lot of things in common, actually, which is why I love, I love working with people because we can really understand that actually we all struggle with a lot of the same things. One of the biggest mistakes that I see, especially autistic uh, people making with regards to growing a business, is that we get so invested in the content of the thing that we love, right? And it's absolutely, it's a great thing to have the thing that you love be your business, especially if it's like a long-term special interest and you really love it, you feel comfortable. But we, I think sometimes we get so caught up in the thing that we love that we forget about the actual business bit 
of it. There are a lot of there are a lot of things you need to do in order to have a successful business that are very difficult for many neurodivergent people. Marketing is a big one that a lot of us struggle with because it feels very inauthentic in a lot of ways. It feels like, oh, we're the sleazy salesperson if we try and sell the thing that we love and we're working on. And so a lot of the work that I do is around getting people into more of a business mindset, getting people away from the, I hate marketing, I hate selling my stuff frame of mind because if you want to have a business you're going to have to sell things without selling things it's a hobby and and turning people around to say actually you can be authentic you can be yourself and you can be a successful business owner but you can't just copy what you see other people doing you have to do it your way and you have to do it a way that that isn't going to burn you out that isn't going to make you feel like a sleazy salesperson or something like that so i think that's a that's a really big one is 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 changing people's mindset about what it means to be in business. And for a long time, I didn't even consider myself a business owner. I felt like a fraud saying, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. And then I looked at what I did and I'm like, well, I literally am. I just didn't have that feel of it. I didn't think that anyone would look at me and think that. I felt so it was a bit of imposter syndrome as well, which is another common thing that many neurodivergent business owners also feel. Because we tend to... When we think of entrepreneur or business owner, we think of a certain definition. Uh, how we see uh, examples in the media, um, they're usually male, um, very confident, very successful, very good at speaking. And I mean, I'm, well, I'm probably very hyperverbal, but you know, there's, I think we all have that certain archetype of what, what a successful entrepreneur looks like. And we don't look like that, but the important thing is we don't have to in order to be successful. And so it's about rewriting the the ideas that society has given us about, first of all, what success looks like, what a business person look, looks like, and how you have to be to run it. Because this whole hustle culture mentality does not work for us because we are so prone to burnout. So preventing burnout is really a crucial part of any business strategy. If you are, especially if you're a one, if you're one person business, you have to look after yourself first, because if you burn out, then the whole thing's going to fall apart. In regards to supporting uh, business owners and entrepreneurs, you recently ran your first ever retreat. It was called the Wild Brains Retreat. What were some lessons you learned about what makes a successful retreat for us as autistic and ADHD entrepreneurs? Just to give some background as to why this suddenly happened. Uh, when I switched, when I started working with, with the entrepreneurs and the business owners, this is all something that I'm doing online. And I knew that I wanted more of a connection with people. So I thought, well, this is great. I'll, I'll work in group and I'll do, it's a group program. So I work in a group and I, and I felt that. And then about a year into it, I was thinking, I want some, I want some real life connection. So it was a little bit of like a, not, I wouldn't say selfish, but it was definitely something I wanted that. And I thought if I wanted that, probably other people would too, because it's fantastic how the internet and social media is able to connect us in this way. But there is still isn't a lot of what I like to call real life, which is not really the, the nicest term, but like in real life, connecting with people like us, because it's difficult to kind of get us all together, like herding cats or something. So that was why I wanted to run a retreat. I also I had many years experience running summer camps for teenagers. And while they weren't specifically neurodivergent teenagers, we did tend to attract that kind of uh, that kind of thing. We had been some really magical uh, memories across the years. I did I did those camp, camps for 10 years. So it was kind of coming back to something that I always loved to do, which is getting people in kind of nature, getting people connected off their phones, uh, get a fire roaring, that sort of thing. And so in terms of what you are saying, which was what were the lessons I learned, I think you just really that there is no there is no formula. You just do what you, what you want to do. Do what makes neurodivergent people happy. Don't feel that you have to follow a formula for su certain kind of success. So for example, we did um, the neurodivergent friendly networking, right? I know that icebreakers and networking is something that many autistic people would cringe at and and honestly maybe avoid. And I thought, okay, well, how can I make it so that the purpose of networking is that we meet as many people as possible and make connections? It's it's not something that a neurotypical person has to dictate how it should be done. 
So I thought, so this was my idea and it actually worked really well. I got a whole bunch of different sticker sets um, off the internet and everyone got a set in their, in their welcome pack. And the purpose of the networking game, because I had to gamify it, was that you had to swap stickers with other people and then you had to basically collect a full set and figure out how many different categories there were to begin with. So there would be like, you know, silly cats stickers, there would be science stickers, this sort of thing. People actually enjoyed this way more than I thought they would. I was a bit like, I wasn't sure this is going to work, but it was an example of, I've taken something networking that is a high stress event or a high stress thing for autistic people. And actually the result we've achieved was the same thing because we got people to know, to connect with each other, to get talking, to interact, but in a really low pressure, the low social way. So you can literally just, you've already got kind of like a script of saying like, what stickers do you have? You know, it's not, that's an icebreaker rather than saying like, let's go around and all introduce ourselves, which I don't do online and I don't do in person because if so, I hate that. When I when I get to an event and, and we go around in a circle and have to introduce ourselves, I hate that. If I hate that, it means probably other people do too. So it's just about like kind of flipping flipping the script or flipping, you know, the idea of of what makes a, this kind of event successful and saying, well, the purpose of, of networking or the purpose of this is, is to get this result. How can we get this result in a low stress way for autistic people? So that was something that, that really worked. I, I don't think when it comes to organizing retreats, I think that neurodivergent people aren't so different from neurotypical people. We all like rest and relaxation. We all like these, you know, community elements in certain ways. So the, the changes that I made were really about trying to say, okay, well, what are the, what are the stress things that we might not think of in a regular retreat and how can I lower that stress level and make it welcoming and inclusive to everyone who comes I wanted to go back to something you said a few minutes ago. You were talking about the, you know, starting the retreat because you wanted to, a certain connection with people kind of in person. Over the years, I'm sure because of the growth of your YouTube, you've had a lot of, co- developed a lot of connections with people, heard from probably people from all over the world. I'm wondering, what did you feel like the, the connection was missing without that kind of in-person connection for you? Well, typically the connections that I make, I, I do have connections with a couple of creators, but we don't have like a secret club where all the big creators <laughs> hang out. Like people say, you should collaborate with this person. And I'm like, yeah, well, they need to reply to my email sort of thing. You know, there's no secret club. Well, if there is, I'm not a member. So the connections that I make, sure, I get emails from people, but it's still a little bit for me personally, as a creator with a large audience, it's a parasocial connection most of the time. Mm-hmm. They've, they've watched my content they know a lot of stuff about me. They connect. They have that connection. I don't have that connection to this random person who sends me an email, you know? And, like, it's, of course, it's lovely to hear from people who say, thank you so much, this is really helpful, or people giving those updates, that's that's amazing. But that isn't a connection for me. That's a connection for them. Yeah, yeah it's, not, it's not actually bad to be selfish in this regard. Like, I wanted to actually connect with people. And what was really nice was I was a bit concerned that it would be a little bit like that, that people wouldn't really talk to me because they thought that I was like a little bit separate or something. It didn't feel like that at all, though. We all just chilled. It was really lovely. I just felt like I was hosting a party a little bit, so I felt like I had to make everyone happy. But that's, you know, that's probably part of it. Yeah. Talking about uh, hosting a party or putting on, you know, some big events, I've definitely put on my share of those. And from my experience, there's always a lot more executive functioning involved in the planning than when I um, uh, anticipate uh, creating uh, such a thing. So I'm wondering how much overwhelm did you have in this planning process of of this retreat? And what will you do for yourself to not ma- only make the 2025 20, Wild Brains retreat successful for, for everyone that attends, but also reduce your overwhelm in planning for the event. This event was was done a little bit running on my ADHD fuse. And then I kind of, my autism had to like, just deal with what I'd put in place. It was very <laughs> last minute. Like I had this idea, I made a vision board last December about like, oh, it's got a tent on it. I want to, I want to do a retreat kind of thing. And, and somehow it just came into, it came into motion very quickly, very last minute as well. 
sometimes that last minute stuff helps because you don't have time to deliberate and think too much. It's it, it. So for me, that's kind of like, I think that the autism ADHD kicks the ADHD side of into sort of crisis management, just get it done, which I feel like for me, that's one way in which they do work quite well together because sometimes I just sort of let one take over a little bit. I did have help with planning. One of my former clients had very kindly offered to help with some of the logistics and planning stuff. So he was really, really helpful in that regard. Um, and I had some support from the, this amazing uh, woman, Sarah, Sarah, I keep on calling her Sarah, Sarah Kent, who also does uh, neurodivergent business coaching. Um, she came to deliver a workshop and she provided a lot of support there as well. So, you know, I didn't do it all alone. But um, how much overwhelm did I have? Less overwhelm than I would have thought. Certainly I experienced a lot of overwhelm when I was planning those summer camps. When I, when I got to the retreat, I had this wonderful realization was that, oh, I can do this, but I'm not responsible for other people's children. And that was a really lovely thing because having that, that additional thing to planning the summer camps, that was really difficult because you were responsible for people's children. That's a big, that's a big thing. Having coming into the space full of adults, I was like, oh, this is great. Actually, I can relax a little bit. I didn't actually have a lot of overwhelm, but I will say that I do have experience planning these kind of events. So it's more practice than, than luck or talent, right? It's just practice. Um, but in terms of 2025, I, I kind of, oh, I don't know, I, I made I made a, my own problem here because I decided that I'm actually going to be running three retreats next year because once again I, my ADHD got overexcited and and is is writing checks that by autism can cash. <laughs> I've put down a couple uh, actually no I've put down one deposit but I have reservations for the dates for for all three um, in a repeat in that in the Netherlands in the UK and and one in California in next November. I'm really excited, a little bit terrified. But I think that just goes to show that for me and for I think most, if not all the people who attended, it was really something special to be surrounded by our peers, our genuine peers for the first time. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with in-person events. Um, I live in the Netherlands, so there are some autism groups. A lot of them, in, a lot of them are in Dutch and I do speak Dutch, but it's still a bit of a barrier for me to attend these and especially in a group setting. I struggle with conversations in groups as it is, let alone conversations in groups in Dutch. So it was pretty amazing for me to be in a group of neurodivergent people, as well as then also business owners who were into the same things as I am, who were interested in all of these different topics in the same way. So it was really special and it had it definitely had a very magical feel to it in terms of how how it made us all feel. And I just was so excited and motivated by by that feeling that I wanted to recreate it. So came home, literally spent two weeks in deep hyper focus. By the end of the two weeks, I had got the dates and got the venues. <laughs> the because yes, I'm hoping that uh, if I can front load the planning, then I can reduce some of the overwhelm. Because that was your original question: How am I actually going to reduce overwhelming planning? <laughs> Um, I hyper-focused for two weeks and I planned out, you know, I got the concept, I got it all, the basics planned out. And then um, hopefully, you know, doing a lot of planning earlier, then for the rest of it, it's just going to be selling the tickets and and planning the program. Because I'm also writing a book at the moment. <laughs> My deadline is next, uh, next July. So um, I'm having to be very, very careful about how I allocate my time and providing enough rest for myself as well because as you can probably tell from this conversation I do have a tendency to go into things a little bit too much a little bit too much commitment to things a little bit too much intensity perhaps so it's very important for me to be very aware of my own physical needs my sensory needs rest needs all of that as I go into this and and take a realistic look about what I can achieve in an average week because I have a lot on my list and um, and then if I don't get it all done, I have to say, okay, actually that's not because I wasn't working. It's because I was not realistic about what I could fit into this week and that's okay. Not too long ago, you did something that I'm very interested in, in, in that you went to a psychedelic retreat and tried psilocybin. I, I do want to say that you, you leave, live somewhere that it, it is legal, so we aren't suggesting illegal drug use. <laughs> 
Howard, from a video you posted about this experience, it sounds like you had many different positive life changes as a result of this. So for those that might be considering taking psilocybin, what do you think are some important things for them to consider? Yeah, so I mean, it is completely legal in in the Netherlands in in a certain form, which is truffles rather than mushrooms, and it's so legal that you can buy it on the internet in a in a legitimate way, right? And you know, they they deliver it kind of thing. And I think in the U.S., it, there are two states where it's currently legal: uh, Oregon and Colorado, I think. Possibly some others where they they are doing a, a lot of really interesting research at the moment on the beneficial effects of of psilocybin therapy, but also other other psychedelics. The first time that I tried psilocybin was shortly after I moved to the Netherlands. I don't know, approximately ten years ago, I would say. My positive experience of that was the effect it had on my my chronic depression at the time. I had I'd been chronically depressed pretty much since since I was a teenager and. After, I would say, a couple of doses over the course of a year or so, um, maybe three or four doses over over a one or two year period, while I'm still prone to depression somewhat, it had really changed that in me. I don't, I am not a chronically depressed person anymore. And that was a really, that was a really big change for me and a very important one. But those experiences were not necessarily profound in the same way that the retreat experience was because the retreat was a very um intentional setting i would you know in my 20s this was just a question of it's legal in this country and let's try it for fun sort of thing you know as you do in your 20s uh but it did have this this unexpected effect i had no idea that it might have this effect at the time but it um it really it really helped the retreat was a little bit more focused on an internal personal path. So it was done with a lot of intention. And I would say, because you asked, you know, what are the important things to consider? Aside from the safety aspect, and the safe, by safety, I mean for people with a history of psychosis or a family history of psychosis or schizophrenia or people on certain drugs, and there is a long list of drugs that you should not take at the same time. So there is a safety component that I think anyone who's thinking about it should look into. I think one of the most important things to think about, if if that is all, you know, if, if that all is good, is that setting an, an intention will help you on your journey and will help you on your on your trip. And that sounds I'm quite a sort of like scientifically minded, skeptical sort of person. Um and it sounds when you say setting intentions, it goes it starts to go into like a little bit more of a spiritual uh thing that maybe I, I was not comfortable with first, but I was open-minded enough to give it a try. And the results that, that I saw, no, results is the wrong word. The journey that I went on was, I don't want to say life-changing, but it, it changed me. But it also didn't change me. It revealed myself to me and allowed me to understand my, my truer self which if you've never tried psilocybin sounds uh, maybe like a bunch of um, uh, something talk, but that experience, um, while it was not always easy and there is a lot of emotional processing that can happen on psilocybin and I believe other psychedelics, but I don't have too much experience with that. I would say for, for anyone interested in, in, in this sort of thing, Doing it in a really safe place somewhere that is also like neurodivergent affirming is very important because the retreat I went on, we had two different trips. The first trip, I came out of it and I was almost a little bit proud of myself that I didn't need the facilitators, right? Because I didn't need them to help me through this emotional stuff. I could do it all by myself, right? Um, And I was proud of myself for that. And on the second trip that we did, uh, I absolutely needed them. And I could not have done it without their support. And they were trained psychologists, uh, trauma specialists and things like that, also with experience with psychedelics. So they really did know what they were doing, which was very reassuring. But I think the important thing that I'm trying to say is that I was I was so proud of myself for not needing anyone. And actually, what I did need was someone in the end, because the processing of trauma, the processing of emotions and all that kind of baggage 
we're not supposed to be doing this alone, no? And for many autistic people, you know, growing up, being told, like, what you're feeling is wrong, all of these things that you're doing are wrong somehow, you have a disorder, you should, you're too sensitive, you shouldn't be feeling that, just control yourself. All of these messages that we've internalized, they make us feel like we can't connect to people anymore. They make us feel like we can't share ourselves with people anymore. And being there, you know, absolutely <laughs> tripping balls and, and essentially with a stranger, but having an emotional connection where I was able to release that, I released through the narrative of, of, of kind of spiritual childbirth, I would say. There was a lot of grunting. Um, <laughs> but I released, I released a great deal of trauma that day. You know, and if you think about like trauma therapies, some of them work on autistic people, some of them don't. Uh, they can be hit or miss, and some people don't respond to them. I was able to take this this substance, this plant medicine that processed so much of that in a couple of hours. And for me, that was it was an amazing experience. And it was difficult. It was really difficult. It was also really amazing. But I feel like I only have positive things that have come out of 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 this of this experience, and and pretty much only positive out of previous psilocybin experiences as well. That was a very long answer. That's what podcasts are for. There, you could have a you could have as long or short of an answer on on podcast. At, at lastly, Sam, how can our listeners learn about you, your upcoming re- three retreats in twenty twenty five, and your your book? The easiest way probably to find out more is to go to my website, which is yosandysound.com. I do have an Instagram account where I, I, I sometimes uninstall and then reinstall my, my Instagram app, but I'm usually around checking it on that. Um, obviously, you can keep up to date on my, my YouTube channel, usually on the community tab, because as you can imagine with, you know, business clients and retreats planning and a book that's being written, I don't have a lot of time for making video content at the moment, but I'm not leaving YouTube or anything like that. It's just that video production is, well, you must know from podcast production, video production is really time intensive. And so I'm kind of putting that a little bit on, on hold for the moment. But I'll, I'll be around. I am planning a couple of things for my, for my YouTube. And yeah, if you get to my website, you can also sign up for my mailing list for the retreats and for business owners who might want some interesting tips and tricks for uh, surviving in the business world while being here at a virtues. Well, Sam, thanks so much for joining me today. I will definitely be checking out your website in the future to hear about all the upcoming things and the community tab on your YouTube channel. So thanks so much for making time to talk with me today. Thanks for having me. It was great to talk. Thanks so much to Sam for the conversation. To learn more about Sam, please check out the link in the podcast description for this episode. We always love hearing from you and would especially love to hear from you relating to this episode regarding how you balance the needs of your business with your needs as a neurodivergent person. Did you know Autism Personal Coach provides neurodiversity affirming support by autistics? For autistics, we empower autistic adults and teens to lead self-directed, purpose-driven lives through our customized life coaching and community groups. Our distinct approach prioritizes each client's unique goals and preferences, fostering a sense of agency and promoting self-advocacy. Coaches work collaboratively with clients to develop personalized strategies and tools that can help with executive functioning, emotional regulation, relationship building, stress management, and much more. We also support parents and partners of autistic people by providing insights and guidance to bridge communication gaps and nurture mutual understanding. With our accessible remote services, individuals from any location can receive the assistance and mentoring they need. So please join us today to experience judgment-free coaching rooted in empathy, expertise, and respect for autistic identity. Until next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.